In this section, Toshiba will introduce the auxiliary system and equipment for the turbine. Please note, as mentioned in the introductory session, this training material contains general information only. Actual operation and maintenance of your plant should be performed in accordance with the specific instruction manuals provided by Toshiba. The components of the auxiliary system, the control system, lubricating oil system and gland steam seal system will be explained. First of all we will explain the control oil system. The EHC oil system comprises two pumps, an oil tank, two oil coolers and two accumulators. It supplies oil to the CVs, MSVs and CRVs via a filter. The small size of the hydraulic cylinders, made possible by the high pressure of the oil, results in high system control. Fire resistant oil is used in this system due to the high fire danger in the event of a high pressure oil leakage. Control oil is maintained at 2400 psi for new combination type MSV and CV valves and at lower pressures for directly connected MSV CV valves. This is a simplified illustration of the EHC control of the MSVs. Two filters, a servo valve and a trip solenoid valve, are attached to the hydraulic cylinder of each MSV. There are two filters with separate oil supplies. Indicators change colour when the differential pressure of the filters is high. A red display indicates that exchange of the elements is necessary. When replacing an element, it is necessary to suspend operation of the EHC pump and thus the turbine must also be stopped. The servo valve controls the position of the hydraulic cylinder using electrical signals from the EHC panel. The hydraulic cylinder is driven by the oil pressure to open or close. Either trip solenoid valve can close the hydraulic cylinder quickly in the event of a turbine trip. The cylinder is reopened by the turbine reset signal. If there is only one MSV, the test valve will be a servo valve. If an additional valve is present, this will be a solenoid valve. However, for combined type MSV CVs, as CV warming does not need to be carried out, a servo valve is not necessary. This figure shows an outline of the control system for CV hydraulic cylinders. The only difference between this system and that of the MSVs is that the piston moves in the opposite direction to open and close the valve. The control system for the IVs is the same as that of the CVs just described. This figure shows an outline of the control system for the RSV hydraulic cylinders. Note that a test solenoid valve is attached instead of a servo valve. The purpose of this valve is to test the RSV function during normal operation. While the solenoid valve is energized, the RSV will be closed and will fully open when the solenoid valve is de-energized. This figure shows the EHC oil unit components of the EHC hydraulic oil system. A single motor drives both the hydraulic feed oil pump and the circulation pump. There is a second motor which functions as a standby. Hydraulic fluid oil pumps are piston pumps and the exit flux can be changed by altering the inclination angle of the pistons. Pressure is controlled by regulating the exit flux. The oil cooler circulation pumps use air to cool the oil before it is sent to the oil coolers. Two accumulators are provided in the oil pressure unit. The accumulators compensate for the reduced oil pressure when the hydraulic cylinders are operated quickly.
This figure shows the top view of the EHC oil unit. The configuration of the major components including the oil coolers, oil pumps and accumulators is illustrated. Next we will explain the lubricating oil system. This is an outline of the lubricating oil system for the turbine and generator equipment. The lubricating oil system supplies oil to the following. All bearings of the turbine and generator, the coupling and the hydrogen seal equipment. The orifice strainer shown on the left hand side of the figure regulates the amount of oil supplied to each bearing. This figure shows an outline of the lubricating oil system auxiliary equipment such as the oil coolers and oil tank. Lubrication oil is supplied by the duty MOP and the standby MOP is available as a reserve. In the event that the power supply to the MOP is lost, a DC driven emergency oil pump will be activated. Oil from the MOP is supplied to the bearings via an oil cooler. The vapour extractor discharges the vapour generated inside the oil tank and an oil conditioner maintains oil purity. This is an example flow diagram for the lubricating oil system. The supply piping is installed inside the return oil piping so that any oil leaked is returned via the return piping. However, as reliability has improved recently, use of such double piping arrangements has decreased. Oil flow condition can be checked at the flow site of the return oil piping. The lubricating oil system comprises the following major equipment. An oil tank, three oil pumps, two main oil coolers, a vapour extractor and the oil conditioning system. This figure indicates the relationship between the main oil tank and the other components of the lubricating oil system. This is an outline of the main oil tank. The MOPs, EOP, vapour extractor, switch panel and oil cooler transfer valve are installed in the upper part of the oil tank. A return oil strainer and a bearing oil pressure regulating valve are located inside. This figure shows side views of the main oil tank. An alarm will be activated when the oil level is within plus or minus 4 inches of the normal oil level. The oil pump will not operate if the oil level is more than 4 inches below the normal value. A rise in oil level usually means an oil cooler is leaking and these should be checked if a rise is observed. If the main oil tank temperature is less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit when starting the MOP it will overload. The figure inset shows the EOP motor in the foreground and the MOP motor in the background with the discharge piping visible beside them. The actual pumps are located inside the tank. This figure illustrates the MOP. Oil passing the suction strainer of the pump is sent to the discharge piping using the centrifugal force of the impeller. A vent pipe is located in the upper part of the discharge piping. Discharge oil is used to lubricate the upper bearing of the pump shaft. Note that if the oil temperature is below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the pump will not operate nor will it operate in the event of a low oil level alarm. This figure shows the EOP. Its structure is the same as that of the MOP.
Two main oil coolers are provided, one being a standby which can be activated using the cooler transfer valve. The procedure is as follows. First open the filler valve and check the vent of the standby cooler to ensure there is sufficient lubrication oil. Open the cooling water flow to the standby oil cooler. Unlock the transfer valve, then change the duty main oil cooler by turning the transfer valve handle and relock the transfer valve. Finally, stop the cooling water flow to the original duty oil cooler and close the filler valve. Presently, there are two types of main oil coolers being used by Toshiba. This diagram shows the assembly of the first type of cooler. Oil flows in through the holes on the upper and lower left hand side and the holes on the right are for cooling water flow. For further details, please consult the instruction manual provided. This figure shows the second type of oil cooler used. Cooling water passes through the tubes and oil flows around them. Usually, the pressure of oil in the cooler is higher than that of the cooling water. Therefore, even if a tube is damaged, cooling water does not enter the oil. The oil coolers described previously utilize the same principle. The vapor extractor reduces the oil tank pressure from minus 1 to minus 1.5 inches H2O using the valve attached to the suction piping. If the vapor extractor fails, the pressure inside the main oil tank will increase and vapor will leak from the turbine bearings, creating a fire hazard. Thus Toshiba recommends suspending turbine operation in the event of a vapor extractor failure. This figure shows the structure of the vapor extractor. The air inlet is located centrally and air discharges from the upper part. Oil collected inside the fan is discharged to the oil tank via the oil drain piping located on the lower section. This figure indicates the relationship of the oil conditioning system equipment to the other components of the lubricating oil system. The oil conditioning system consists of the oil conditioner pump, pre-filter and coalescer filter. Oil extracted from the oil tank by the pump is returned to the oil tank via these two filters. The water removal efficiency of the oil conditioner is less than 500 parts per million at the outlet. The filtration particle size is 78.7 micro inches and the allowable pressure drop is 14.5 psi. This is a side view of the oil conditioner. The local indicator board is located on the front of the filler tanks. The filter water level gauge is installed on the left side of the coalescer. The amount of water removed by the coalescer filter should be monitored using the coalescer filter water level gauge. If the water level reaches the set value, use the filter drain valve to discharge it. When the oil conditioner is operating, it is important to monitor the pressure gauge indication continuously. The filter elements should be exchanged if the differential pressure, calculated from the inlet and outlet pressure, exceeds 14.5 psi. The final system to be explained in this section is the gland steam seal system. This system functions to prevent air leakage into and steam leakage out of the HIP turbine gland seal and air leakage into the LP turbine gland seal. During turbine startup, 
Gland steam is supplied by the auxiliary steam system and is controlled by four SSFVs. When the SSFVs are malfunctioning, manual control can be performed by opening the SSFBV. After loading up, the shaft seal pressure in the HIP turbine will rise and the auxiliary steam supply will no longer be required. At this time, steam will be supplied by the HIP gland seal and gland steam pressure will be controlled by the SPUVs. The entire process is normally performed automatically by DCS or EHC. The standard value of gland steam pressure is between 3 to 6 psi. The minimum value is 1.5 psi and the maximum is 7 psi. The shaft seal steam is extracted using the gland steam exhausting line. There are two gland steam exhausters, one of which is a standby. Steam extracted by the gland steam exhauster is cooled by the gland condenser. The major equipment of the gland steam seal system comprises the gland steam condenser and the gland steam exhauster, both of which are shown in this figure. This is an illustration of the gland steam condenser. Heat exchange is carried out between the steam extracted by the gland steam exhauster and the condensate water. Thus, while the gland steam is required, the condensate pump must be continuously operated. When starting the gland steam condenser, check that the U-seal drain is full of water. This figure shows the gland steam exhauster. The gland steam condenser pressure is maintained between 8.7 and 12.6 inches H2O with the valve located in the suction piping of the gland steam exhauster. Since steam may leak into the lubrication oil system from the shaft seal when the gland steam pressure increases, care must be taken not to exceed the maximum threshold. Pressure less than the minimum threshold will result in loss of the gland steam seal system function. That concludes the classroom lecture on the auxiliary systems and equipment of the turbine.